Remember Lot's wife. Now, Lot, as you know, was a man who was nephew of Abraham and uh, his father, Haran, H-A-R-A-N, uh, was uh, Abraham's brother and was deceased. There is a uh, story, a Jewish uh, source, <clears throat> that, uh, uh, that Haran was a firm, uh, faithful believer in polytheism and specifically <clears throat> uh, his uh, god or uh, his chosen god was the moon goddess and that Haran, uh, upon conversion and calling of Abraham, that Haran withstood Abraham and the uh, true God, and uh, he, that he was destroyed in the temple in which he worshiped uh, as a result of this confrontation. That is not something that is confirmed by scripture, but I think it is uh, perhaps uh, an interesting thought because <clears throat> in the story of Lot and of Abraham, uh, it seems that there was a, a sense of responsibility that uh, Abraham felt toward his nephew Lot. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, we read that the genealogy of Terah goes like this. Terah begot Abraham or Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran, or Haran, begot Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans, or the Chaldeans. Now, there were two Urs, and uh, <clears throat> my understanding is that this particular Ur uh, specifically is in Ur uh, in the uh, uh, south of... Uh, of, uh, to the southwest, I think it would be, of Babylon uh, in, uh, uh, just off of the uh, Euphrates River. Uh, it was, some scholars believe, a uh, city of uh, uh, great learning for that time, much as a university city would be in our day. <clears throat> uh, there, there have been many records, books, or not books, but uh, um, uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, cylinders, I guess it would be, and tablets that have been found, of which date to that time, indicating that there was that a lot of learning in Ur. Uh, God called Abraham or Abram, as he was initially, out of Ur. <clears throat> and um, my understanding would be that Abram was not uh, an ignorant man, that he, uh, even though he dwelt in tents later, uh, that he was a city dweller, uh, that his father Terah probably was a merchant, a man of substance, and um, after they journeyed from Ur, they went to the north, northwest, uh, up, th up along the Euphrates River, probably, uh, ultimately up the uh, Habur River, K A. Well, in the, in the Arabic, I think it is today, uh, or transliteration from the Arabic would be K H A B O R. I've been on the Habur. Uh, I visited some of the ruins uh, that have been excavated. Uh, and worked on an archaeological project in this region of the country where Abraham, or Abram, and his father Terah uh, dwelt after leaving Ur. <coughs> At Haran, uh, Terah, Abram's father, died, and uh, uh, Abram then was uh, called to uh, leave and to continue on. Verse 31 of Genesis 11 says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. 
Now, we don't know why they stopped at Haran. Haran, although it is on the, uh, the track that would most often be uh, employed to journey from Ur uh, to uh, Canaan, that is, you go up the Euphrates River and then trek down and southwestward into Canaan. When they arrived at Haran, which is in northern Syria, right on the border uh, probably of uh, Turkey, Syria today, um, apparently Terah was unable to continue. I, I would assume he, uh, being advanced in years, that uh, he, he uh, had to uh, discontinue the journey and, and Abram, or Abram, remained with him as a dutiful son and cared for him until his death, at which time, then, uh, Abram departed. Notice Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. This all background and setting for what Jesus said uh, uh, that we should uh, must do. Remember Lot's wife. So Abram, after his father had died, departed as the Eternal had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now, the... Uh, Again, the uh, thought is that Lot uh, attached himself to Abram, although Abram, or Abraham, felt a duty, a responsibility uh, to look after his nephew. And again, <clears throat> the Jewish tradition holds that uh, part of the reason for this bond and this sense of duty that Abram had toward Lot was that uh, because of the death of his father in the confrontation and con conflagration of the temple of the, the moon goddess. But Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, going down into Canaan. <clears throat> Verse, uh, chapter 13, picking up the story. Uh, verse 1, Abram went up from Egypt. So they got into Canaan, and uh, there was a drought in those days, and uh, they went on down into Egypt. You know the story of how Abram told his wife, uh, Sarah, to say that she was his sister, to try to circumvent a situation which might cause a problem. It didn't uh, circumvent the situation, and God had to rescue uh, Abram and uh, Sarah from uh, their own uh, calamity that uh, may have been attributed to their own folly. So they left Egypt, <coughs> Abram and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, and silver and in gold, and uh, he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot also went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Okay, so Lot was uh, a follower. And Lot continued, journeyed along wherever Abram went, Lot, who was probably now uh, well past 50 years of age, one would assume, uh, certainly uh, an adult with uh, responsibilities of his own because of looking at the wealth uh, that he had accrued, uh, Lot still remained attached to Abram. Lot also went with him. Now, the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And so there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's or Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. Now that's incidental, but it is an important part of the story. The Canaanites and Perizzites also dwelt in that land, and basically they, they probably, well, one would say, they predominate. Uh, predominated uh, in the land. And so <clears throat> Lot said to, uh, I'm sorry, Abram said to Lot, notice who initiated the, uh, the peace process. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. 
Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Verse 10. Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered and everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Everywhere it was like the garden of the eternal, like the land of Egypt as you go to toward Zoar. And so Lot made the choice. Now remember, Lot had attached himself to Abram. He continued to follow Abram or Abraham. And uh, he was the junior of the two. Certainly, Abraham had the right to make the choice by virtue of age and seniority, whatever you want to look at. But um, Lot was given an offer, and Lot accepted. And he chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Now, when they got in, he got to uh, the land and he prospered. Uh, he became a, uh, a man of uh, some standing in the community of uh, Sodom, a city in the plain where he dwelt. In a book entitled All the Men of the Bible, it's a common and very popular work by Herbert Lockyer, uh, he uh, has a, an account of Lot that I think is very instructive. Lot, the son of Haran, Abraham's brother who accompanied Abraham from Mesopotamia to Canaan. And then the scriptural uh, citations. Subtitle or subheading, he calls him the man with a worldly mind. The man with a worldly mind. We deem it necessary to spend a little time with this character because we believe Lot to be a representative man. Perhaps there is no Bible figure who represents so many men of today as Lot of Sodom, where you can find one Abraham or one Daniel or Joshua, you will find a thousand Lots, I might say a million today. Lot started out well, but he acquired riches, and with his wealth came trouble. He and his uncle, Abraham, came out of Egypt with great possessions. And then came the strife among the herdsmen, which we just read about. Lot should have asked Abraham to choose for him. But no, when he lifted up his eyes and saw the fruitful land, his decision was made because of his selfishness and his avarice. The moments of solemn, decisive choice reveal the character of the two men involved. Lot's choice was a bad and selfish one, ending in disaster. Abraham's choice was lofty, unworldly, superior to all petty considerations. Although as elder of the two, Abraham had the indisputable right to precedence in the choice. Abraham behaved like the high-minded, noble-hearted gentleman he was, and so left the choice to Lot. The meanness of Lot is seen in that he took the best. The crisis of that moment was decided by the tenor of Lot's life, by how he lived. In spite of his general righteousness, <clears throat> Lot must have had a vein of great selfishness within. In one of his unique speeches, entitled, The Subject of Salaries, Benjamin Franklin said, quote, There are two passions which have a powerful influence in the affairs of men. These are ambition and avarice, the love of power and the love of money. Separately, each of these has great force in prompting man to action. But when united in view of the same object, they have in many minds the most violent effects. It was thus that Lot became a bad lot. In his choice, ambition and avarice became one. Points to ponder are, one, his wealth. Lot had a house, 
Con contrasted to that, Abraham was content with a tent. Two, his choice. Lot was guided by selfishness and pitching his tent toward Sodom was soon living in it. In other words, he first went next to Sodom outside of the city and shortly thereafter he was in it showing the steps one seems to take toward uh, an accommodation with sin and uh, falling into it. Three, his righteous soul, as described in 2 Peter 2.8, uh, Lot did many things that were inconsistent with his true character and that were dishonoring to God. He sat down with the ungodly, yet he showed some good qualities. He entertained the angels, believed their message, endeavored to restrain the wicked Sodomites. His good, however, was mixed with evil. And four, his loss. <clears throat> Lot narrowly escaped judgment. He lost everything. His wife was turned into a pillar of salt. He lost his wealth. He sacrificed his influence for the people of Sodom despised him. His relatives mocked him. His two daughters shamed him. Lot offered no prayer for Sodom and manifested no desire for the salvation of its people. His only concern was for his own safety and angels delivered him. From all the men of the Bible by Herbert Lockyer in a very appropriate, I think, and very apt description. Concerning the city of Sodom, from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, <coughs> subject Sodom, it uh, describes the, the uh, city, Sodom, as one of the five cities of the plain destroyed by fire from heaven in the time of Abraham and Lot. The wickedness of the city became proverbial. And it, by the way, not only in Hebrew literature, but uh, in the Arabic world as well to this day. There are places that are marked as uh, Mount uh, Sodom and uh, the pillars in the Arab uh, of, uh, uh, that are labeled as uh, Lot's wife to this day. The wickedness of the city became proverbial. The sin of sodomy was an offense against nature frequently connected with idolatrous practices, according to Rawlinson in his History of Phoenicia. The fate of Sodom and Gomorrah is used as a warning to those who reject the truth of the gospel. And then a citation of the scriptures. The name is still preserved to this day in Yebel Uzdem, that is Mount Sodom. Now, the uh, term that came to be applied to the people of Sodom, the ones uh, who died there, uh, Sodomite, <coughs> In, is in the Hebrew, uh, Kadesh. It denotes properly a male temple prostitute. In other words, sodomite uh, down through time, the, t the uh, term uh, was applied to those who were male temple prostitutes in the pagan Baal uh, religions and other pagan religions of the Middle East. One of the class attached to certain uh, sanctuaries of heathen deities and consecrated to the impure rites of their worship. Such gross and degrading practices in God's land could only be construed as a flagrant outrage and any association of these with his pure worship was abhorrent, Deuteronomy chapter 23, 17 and following verses. Deuteronomy 23, 17. In other words, Almighty God abhorred any semblance or anything like this kind of impure and uh, immoral conduct. The presence of sodomites is noted as a mark of degeneracy in Rehoboam's time, 1 Kings 14, 24. During the reign of Rehoboam, 1 Kings 14, 24, Asa endeavored to get rid of them 
and Jehoshaphat routed them out. Subsequent corruptions opened the way for their return, and Josiah had to break down their houses, which were actually, quote, in the house of the eternal. They had uh, rooms, actually chambers, in the, in the very house of God for uh, these sodomites in the days of uh, Josiah. <clears throat> there were the feminine uh, side also, <clears throat> uh, who were uh, temple prostitutes, the female prostitutes, uh, numerous scriptures relating to them. Hosea 4.14 and Deuteronomy 23.17 and, and other scriptures. Uh, the English word um, is derived from Sodom, the inhabitants of which were in evil repute for unnatural vice. So this is the uh, uh, city uh, in which Lot and his wife resided. Now concerning what happened when uh, in that instance, what Jesus was pointing uh, two, it's important to understand, I think, that after Abram and Lot separated, Lot moved next to Sodom, and before long, Lot was living in Sodom. Uh, the movie, the uh, Hollywood version of uh, the story, is, I think, instructive and, uh, and also profitable, but uh, it certainly uh, has uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, Hollywood in it, and I am quite sure it's uh, a lot of it is very erroneous, but uh, it is interesting to note that they do picture this progression that uh, Lot and his family and followers first pitched their tents in the valley, the, the Jordan Valley. Uh, they had, uh, they began to prosper, they had some trials and problems, and there was a a natural progression as time went on, uh, an attack from uh, some neighboring uh, tribes, and uh, <clears throat> they had their, their tents uh, destroyed, and it was natural for them to move into the city of Sodom and take up dwelling, and eventually they became quite wealthy. Lot became a very wealthy man <clears throat> trading in the city of Sodom. We read that uh, the uh, kings, uh, uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, and now Tidal, king of nations, all came. Now, this uh, king of Elam, by the way, the Elamites were east of the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. I mean, that is east of Babylon. Uh, these, uh, these kings were an amalgam of uh, kings from uh, some very distant uh, lands. Uh, they, uh, they came a long way to raid uh, in the uh, Jordan Valley and uh, Transjordan. They made this war with uh, Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shunab, king of Adma. Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the va valley of Sidom, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedor, Laomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedor, Laomer, and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Carnaim, the Susim in Ham, the Emim in Shava Kiriathim, and the Horites in their mountain of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So they made a sweep all down the Jordan Valley, all the way down to uh, the wilderness uh, in uh, the uh, Sinai Peninsula. And then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh. <coughs> That's uh, probably uh, in the uh, area of, if not uh, Petra, uh, the ancient uh, site in uh, southern uh, Jordan. And they attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hezizan Tamar. 
and the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sidim against the kings of Elam, and so on, and they lost. They were defeated. Now, the valley of Sidim was full of asphalt pits, or bitumen pits. Uh, it was a shock to me some years ago when I was uh, visiting one of the ancient uh, sites on the um, uh, Euphrates River. <coughs> um, a very a major city. Uh, one of the uh, uh, capital cities of the Babylonian uh, world and empire, a frontier city. It was shocking to me to find tarmac or asphalted sidewalks and walkways within the city, the gated built uh, city. Um, I mean asphalt this thick where they had apparently dug the asphalt from these pits and brought it into or transported it over to uh, the Euphrates and down the Euphrates River, and they used it for paving the walkways inside the cities of uh, the land of uh, Shinar. Amazing. And so they um, defeated the kings, and they took Lot, Abram's brother, uh, a brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods which were considerable he was wealthy and they departed now we read the rescue of Lot in Genesis chapter 14 uh, continuing on uh, as you know Abraham uh, gathered together his uh, servants it's amazing that Abraham with a just uh, being a private citizen and having a very uh, limited resources as it were, uh, he still was able to overcome uh, that portion of the uh, party that uh, had, uh, were holding Lot and his family. Uh, most of the scholars will tell you, most of the commentaries I think, that it is believed that uh, the kings split up and uh, broke into smaller parties after having defeated the kings of uh, the five cities of the plain. <clears throat> Be that as it may, it was still a God's victory that gave Abraham and his servants the, uh, uh, the victory. In that case, it was God's. Well, Lot failed to learn the lesson, it would appear, and to heed the warning of that incident, went back into Sodom, and he continued to live there. If one can take the movie uh, Sodom as a uh, representation of uh, the uh, uh, affairs in uh, the city of Sodom and of uh, Lot's uh, conduct there, uh, Lot and uh, the uh, family of Lot became extremely involved in the corruption of the city of Sodom. It started out very, very nicely. Lot was a righteous man. Lot moved next to Sodom. Lot finally moved into the city of Sodom, became totally enmeshed, became a judge sitting at the gate in the very city of Sodom. And you know this, then, then the account in Genesis chapter 19 where the uh, two angels or messengers came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom, apparently as <clears throat> one who was uh, a judge. And by the way, judges in those days did not sit independently as uh, typically it is done in our uh, system today. Uh, judges were um, men of substance and men of standing who sat together as a collective body to judge uh, the affairs of a city. I have uh, had experience of sitting in uh, a uh, situation of that sort in an Arabic country 
and it's uh, it's quite uh, interesting. For example, <clears throat> in 1986, I think I was um, I was taken before a military uh, court in. Um, um, Ah, I can't think of the name of the city in our town now. It's between um, between Damascus and Amman. Uh, see the movie Lawrence of Arabia, and you'll you'll find uh, you'll see the little town right on the border there. Uh, when I appeared for having apparently uh, violated one of the uh, uh, terms of uh, my stay in the city of or the land of Syria. Uh, the country, I, um, I was standing and brought before this uh, this uh, court, as it were. Uh, I don't know how many, perhaps a half a dozen on each side of me, and I was brought before this um, uh, military judge <clears throat> to uh, answer for my sins. And uh, it was a, an interesting experience that I won't take the time to tell you about now, but uh, I think I have a sense of, of what it was like in those days uh, where they judged and it was a, a, a open an open affair. Uh, anybody could come in, any uh, member of the community could wander in, sit down and listen to uh, the proceedings and if they got bored like uh, we typically do when we sit too long, uh, things get boring, then they'd get up and go out and that was the end of that. You wonder, well, who was that masked man? You know, he, he departed, but he, he uh, had no, he had no official function there. He had a right to be there and he could have, he could have uh, communicated uh, in the uh, uh, hearings and the proceeding if he had chosen to, but uh, didn't have to. Anyway, <clears throat> the, uh, apparently Lot was among those who were judging. And uh, they, um, uh, these two angels came, and uh, you know how they were accosted by the uh, inhabitants of, of Sodom. And the inhabitants of Sodom literally sought to take them forcibly out of Lot's house. I think that uh, Lot recognized these men as being different. Not hard to tell a difference between the carnal worldly mind and, and uh, worldly person and one who is holy and righteous. There's a, uh, a rather stark contrast between the two. Uh, there really is. Well, um, the men of Sodom intended to forcibly take them out and sodomize them as they said, bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out th through the door and shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren. Notice he refers to them as his brethren. He considered himself a sodomite. He was one of them in his heart and mind. And he said, don't do this because these are my guests. And uh, this was considered uh, improper uh, uh, in, in that society, just as it would be in ours today. In a book, again, <coughs> uh, by Herbert Lockyer, he says, the evil principle, which the Bible has uh, no hesitation in calling sin, which had already wrought terrible havoc in the world is again conspicuous in the chapter uh, concerning the uh, story of Sodom and the Sodomites. The trail of the serpent can be traced in the inhuman loathsomeness of the men of Sodom, in the incredible shame of Lot toward his daughters, and in their unnatural action toward their father. The prophet Ezekiel wrote of the iniquity of Sodom and of her pridefulness of bread and abundant idleness. Now, today I've heard it is uh, uh, fashionable to refer to the sin of the Sodomites as being inhospitality. 
uh, it's not fashionable today to uh, speak of sin in the terms in which God does. The sin of Sodom, according to modern religionists, was inhospitality. The identity of the three heavenly visitors can be easily dis distinguished. One was the Lord himself. The other two who arrived at Sodom were his angelic messengers. Lot's reception of the angels lacked the warmth Abraham had extended to them. Lot's character had deteriorated. Living in Sodom had sapped those springs of spiritual power so prominent in Abraham. This is Lockyer's uh, assessment of uh, an evaluation of the character of the man, Lot. An aggravation of the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah is seen in the fact that they were the descendants of righteous Noah and had become so utterly wicked less than 100 years, probably a bit more, but, well, less than 100 years after his death. Less than 100 years after his death, they had sunk to this depth. The sins of these guilty cities cover almost the possibilities of human wickedness. That's, uh, that's an interesting thought, but I think it's valid. Their sins were such that they, they actually represent and they cover the, the whole breadth of rottenness and filth and uh, evil of mankind, pride, satiety, shamelessness, evil influences, adultery, filthy conversation and fornication, sodomy or uh, uh, homosexuality. And then he cites a bunch of scriptures. They all, all the scriptures and all the, the prophets cry out for divine punishment on such. They were bestial. Evidently, Lot, as he entertained the angels, came to believe their solemn message and endeavored to restrain the wicked sodomites who sought to commit sodomy with these angels. Lot's low moral standard appears in his willingness to hand over his daughters to the lustful sodomites. He wanted to commit one sin in order to prevent another. Prostitution, he felt, would not be as bad as sodomy or homosexuality, as we now call it. The record shows that Lot, Lot offered no prayer for Sodom, as Abraham had done. He offered no desire for the salvation of the sinners in Sodom. Because of his compromise, the people of Sodom despised him, and he lost his influence, the influence he had had with his own family. Jude describes the Sodomites as those who, quote, defiled the flesh, despised dominion, spoke evil of dignities. The licentiousness and contempt of dominion are seen in the actions of the Sodomites despising Lot's entreaty and charging the door of Lot's house to drag his visitors out. As you know, God smote them with blindness. There's an interesting uh, statement or uh, analysis of the, the blindness that, uh, with which they were smitten too. It is a, the Hebrew word is a form of, uh, of, uh, of the word that is used, I think, only two or three times and in every case. It is different from the usual kind of blindness where one simply loses sight. That was not the case. <clears throat> it was a kind of blindness where they, um, their, their sight was distorted and they were actually reaching for the door and when they thought they were, they, by their eyesight, they could see the door and they were reaching in another way and, and grabbing another individual who resented it and then the fighting and the quarrels all broke out. So it was a distortion of their eyesight, not a blindness uh, in a, a strict and literal sense. Lockyer makes an observation too, and I think this one is uh, relevant and important. He said, cures of blindness, that is, curing blindness is one of the Lord's most frequent miracles. In the case of the sodomite, God deprived them of their proper sight 
as he did in the case of the Syrians who came to take Elisha, and of Elimus, the sorcerer, in Acts 13.11. And then he comments on the, the word uh, used here for blindness. It's only used here, and also in 2 Kings 6.18. And in both cases, actual permanent blindness is not meant but a temporary derangement of op optical powers. Eliot comments, and he quotes, the word really means a disturbance of vision caused by the eye not being in its proper connection with the brain. And so the men of Sodom ever seemed just upon the point of reaching the door and pressed on and strove and quarreled but always failed. They knew not how, but as they always supposed by another's fault. It is a strange picture of men given over to unbelief and sin and who see not because they reject the truth. And so it, there was a, a miracle performed in this instance by the uh, angels of God, uh, a, a form of blindness that was smit, that smote these men in order to protect Lot in that instance. The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah cried to the eternal for vengeance. Our Lord's description of the Sodomites implies a condition now get this, a condition of indifference regarding their impending peril. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 17. And let's read what Jesus said when he, uh, he said to remember Lot's wife. Maybe we, we uh, should actually read uh, the context and uh, get uh, some of the background to the statement. And it's, it's much more powerful <clears throat> when uh, we go back to uh, the beginning of the thought. <clears throat> Christ had been healing the lepers in the earlier part of Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> One of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and glorified God and fell down on his feet, verse 16, Luke 17, verse 16, and gave thanks. And he was a Samaritan. In other words, he was an exception. And the, the implication is the reason the exception is because he was an outsider and not an insider, not a, um, a member of the, the community, if you please. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said to, unto him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you whole. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, verse 20, the very continuing right on, the Pharisees, having seen this, continued right on, they demanded of him, when the kingdom of God should come. Because of this miracle, other miracles, other things that Jesus was saying and doing, then, then it was imperative in their minds for him to answer the question, get right to the heart of the matter, when is the kingdom coming? And he answered them and said, verse 20, the kingdom of, co of God comes not with observation in the King James outward show is a better translation that is with pomp and circumstance and with a lot of ceremony the kingdom of God is does not come or is not coming with uh, the outward show that you are looking for and expecting neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, you know that uh, <clears throat> all of, virtually every other translation says, is in your midst. The king was there. The, re the uh, chief representative was there in their midst. The kingdom of God in no way could be construed as being within those wicked men. And he said unto the disciples, now verse 22, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. 
And they shall say to you, See here or see there, go not after them nor follow them. For as the lightning that lights one part of under heaven shining under the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, verse 26, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And so he is picturing then that uh, the time, or he's stating the time of his, the establishment of the kingdom of God it will be as in the days of Noah when everyone is going to be wrapped up and all concerned about the uh, circumstances of life and the old prepared to meet the circumstances of God. Likewise, <clears throat> verse 28, 28, also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they build it, but the same day that Lot went out or was uh, taken out, dragged out virtually of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, verse 30, shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so first, he points to the conditions, the circumstances in Sodom, in in the context of, of the discussion or answer to the Pharisees who asked him, when would the kingdom come? When is he going to establish the kingdom? He said, it will be in this way when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Remember. Why? Because Lot turned back. I'm sorry, his wife turned back. Lot had to be dragged out, and his family, his wife and his two daughters had to be dragged out. But Lot's wife sought to go back. She wanted to go back. She did not want to give up and surrender those pleasures back in her home in Sodom. Verse 33, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Christ teaches a principle. Those who, who believe that they are going to save their skin by remaining a part of some physical organization or a congregation or some group are going to find that they will lose what they are hoping for, searching for, striving for, because they have lost sight of the need, the personal responsibility and the personal need for that relationship with Almighty God. The kind of relationship that Abraham had, not the kind of relationship that Lot had, and certainly not the kind of relationship that Lot's wife had. He said, I tell you, that in that night there shall be two men in one bed, one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women grinding together, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. You don't have to worry about where it's going to be. A lot of people have spent a lot of hours of, uh, and time uh, stewing uh, concerning themselves about uh, the place of safety. I've heard it until I've almost, uh, well, I don't want to hear it again. 
Where is the place of safety? When are we going? How, what are the signs and what are the circumstances? If that's, if that's where our focus is, we're not going to be there. I can almost guarantee you we won't be there, wherever it is. There are individuals today who have not and are not remembering the warning Jesus Christ gave to remember Lot's wife who looked back and wanted to go back and wanted to, to live like they, uh, with the pleasures of the life in the world. Individuals who want to go back into the religious life of the world and become a part of the religions of the world rather than to remain steadfast and to set an example, to live an example, following faithfully in the steps of Jesus Christ at any and all cost. And then there are those who know better, who really know and who, who understand what is happening. And they are the ones we ought to strive to help because in too many cases, they are being like Lot, who procrastinated and who clung to that, that lifestyle, those, those uh, comforts and the circumstances he had in the city of Sodom, in spite of the, all of the filth that existed, the corruption and the evil of that society. Even Lockyer, in his uh, commentary, <clears throat> speaks of uh, uh, of the uh, city of uh, the of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, "The fact that the apostate and wicked Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's residents, were in the very midst of Canaan, aggravated the guilt of the Canaanites, who in Joshua's time took no warning." from their punishment to avoid their sins. And he cites Leviticus 18, 24, and 25, and Joshua 10, 40. These cesspools of wickedness were only 20 miles from the city of Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem and the uh, priest of the Most High God, a righteous priest. The doom of these cities was foretold by God and is often referred to in Scripture, and it is a forerunner of the conditions of these things on earth at the time of Christ's return as it draws near. The terrible catastrophe overtaking the cities is confirmed by ancient historians and also by present-day archaeologists and travelers. And that is true. I have mentioned before how recent archaeological excavations have found uh, references to the five cities of the plain, and they are in the proper relationship as indicated in Scripture. The five cities of the plains, the ones uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, which were destroyed, and Zoar, uh, which... Uh, uh, was not was spared it was i think zoar in hebrew means insignificant is uh, if i'm not mistaken zoar was probably the least and the most insignificant of the cities and it was the one that was spared why would jesus then have us to remember lot's wife uh, let's take a look at the lessons that we can that we have seen here and that we can learn from uh, this example. It's very important. It's a very important lesson because it relates to our day. It relates to the end time for us today in a very profound way. The lessons for Lot and his wife, which are important for us, number one, Lot procrastinated. Lot lingered in a sinful environment. And he knew it. Lot understood. Lot had been trained and educated and taught. He knew better. 
That's the important thing. And he lingered. Number two, Lot was afflicted with ambition and avarice. That is, Lot would not take a back step or back seat. <coughs> he put himself forward. He was thinking of himself, and it's exemplified by his example in the choice of land when Abraham said, let's separate. He clung to Abraham. He clung to the skirt of the one who was being blessed by God. It was to his advantage to stay by Abraham. And he used his uncle. He used that man, that righteous man. He rode his back, as it were, until the day came, the conflict arose, and the conflict was the fault for the conflict. The, the cause of the conflict was Lot's and the lust or avarice or the greed of Lot, not Abraham. And when Abraham sought peace and terms of peace, he offered Lot the choice, and Lot took it. He stepped right up, and he chose the, uh, what appeared to be the choice land. Number three, Lot's wife <coughs> could not give up the pleasures, the lifestyle, if you please, of Sodom. Even in the face of impending doom, she clung to that lifestyle, she clung to those, those physical things, and she sought to go back into those physical things, into that environment to retain those things. In reality, they both lacked faith in God. Yes, Lot feared when the angels came and they woke him up, Lot finally got his eyes open and said, we've got to get out of here. Yes, it is true. I recognize these men. They were like what he remembered with his father or uncle Abraham. These were men of righteousness, as he presumed. And he knew it. And he, re he responded but he didn't really have faith because when he was dragged out, literally, forcibly dragged out on that occasion, he didn't really want to go outside of the city complexes. He asked for permission to reside at this neighboring city of Zoar. Insignificant. It's just a little town. Of course, it, it was infe infected with the same disease, the same influences, the same uh, viruses as the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot and his wife really did not have faith. They could not step out and move out on the instruction direction when God gave it. It's not easy to step out. It isn't easy. When God leads and when it makes, he makes it very clear, one has to make a move. You've had to do it, all of you. You know what I'm talking about, and it is not easy. Lot and his wife and the two daughters were dragged out, and there are some individuals today who may well never leave, a spiritual Sodom and a spiritual Gomorrah without somebody virtually dragging them out. And there isn't going to be a person to drag every individual out of the spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah. Just isn't going to happen. <clears throat> we can try. We can work very hard to try to drag people and to encourage people. 
but it just isn't going to happen. In the book of Revelation, <clears throat> we're told, I won't turn there, but we're told to come out of Babylon, this spiritual Babylon. You know, the word Babylon uh, comes from Babel, uh, and uh, it means confusion. <clears throat> Isn't that right? Babel means confusion. But you know, it, the sense of the word, the real meaning of the word goes beyond just confusion. It means confusion by mixing. Remember that. It is the definition of Babel or Babylon may, is confusion by mixing. Now you think of this, what Satan has done with Christianity was to mix, to assimilate into Christianity certain of the pagan rites and rituals and concepts and philosophies to assimilate those, to mix those until what is nominal Christianity is confusion. It is Babylon. Spiritually speaking, it is Babylon. And I, would ne I never understood, I never understood when I was younger and in college and after, why Mr. Armstrong was so adamant against accepting certain points, both points of truth, and saying and bringing those points of truth into the church. Mr. Armstrong was very strict about not going to the the so-called works of the scholars for his proof, for his uh, support, for the proof of doctrine. And now I understand why. I really understand why today. Because about 5% of error is all it takes to so totally corrupt that the whole point is lost. In Revelation, we find there's coming a time when two men, two individuals, two witnesses, whoever they may be, are going to stand before the whole world and they are going to warn the world because apparently this is the only way to really get the world's attention in this end time in a powerful and effective way. We are coming to the time, the point where humanity has so many distractions. There are so many things to take the, the attention and to demand the attention of humanity that it is going to require two individuals with the kind of power and the will, the strength, the spiritual strength and determination to do that work, to stand and be heard and to perform and demonstrate the power of God. And then their bodies are going to lie for three days in the streets of that city, that great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, Revelation 11, verse 8. And then men will rejoice and think that they have finally been able to overpower and overcome these two individuals who were the witnesses of God, the ones who warned them of the impending doom and disaster as two angelic beings warned Sodom or Lot and his family in Sodom and virtually dragged them out. And those two witnesses then will be resurrected, and that's when it's all over. 
Jesus Christ gave us the example <clears throat> and the warning to remember Lot's example and his wife, to remember the story or the example of Sodom. The prophets of Israel warned the people of Israel constantly to repent, to remember, to look to the example and the destruction of Sodom, and they refused. The question for us today is, will we individually heed the lessons of Lot and the warning for Lot, uh, for us, of Lot and his wife? Or will we linger a little while in sin or in a sinful environment which God has called us to come out of? Will we just linger a little longer and say, well, tomorrow, well, I don't think it's really that bad. Are the lusts of the flesh, the pleasures of this society, more important to us than fleeing modern spiritual Sodom? Is the glory of spiritual Babylon so alluring that we will cling to her when God cries out and tells us, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, of the plagues. It's time to make a choice. I know that many of you out there who are listening to these uh, tapes that we're sending out, I know that many are not, are not, have not come to the point where you, you feel compelled to make a choice, make a decision. You're in the process. But I'm telling you, it is time to make a choice. It is time not to linger as did Lot, but to get on with it and flee. Because if you stay too long in spiritual Sodom, it is going to be too late just as it was for those who stayed too long in physical Sodom. I do hope and pray that those hundreds of you who are listening to these tapes will take heed and take seriously the warning that I am giving you today. We are in a time of crisis. We, the people of God, are in the last days and in a time of crisis. Big things are going to happen, and they're going to happen relatively soon. I'm not setting dates any more than anybody else uh, is in global. But big things are ahead, and it's time for some of you to make the decision.